why did God create war? Why does God create murder? Why does God create all the, the horrific things we see in the news? How dare you? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that is not our fault? Just walk into any children's hospital, and you know there's no God. At least no good God. Maybe there's an evil God. Those children are dying at the same random rate, even though their parents are desperately praying, desperately loving those kids. Where did the Bible come from? Why is the Bible trustworthy? Um, who is God? Why is he so hidden? Why is he so hard to understand? All of these questions started popping up like crazy, and I, I couldn't control them. And I, I was trying desperately to find the answers. By the end of it, after several years, I finally had to be honest with myself and say, I don't believe in this anymore. God is supposed to show up when you seek him, and I sought him for years, and I didn't find him. And this is where I've come to. This is what I've concluded. Then he must not be there. Well, good morning to you, church family. I'm glad you're here in the room. We're glad that you're here joining us online. And uh, I got to tell you, I really am excited about this message this morning. And, and let me tell you why. Because I really do believe that God wants to speak to every single one of us in the midst of this chaos called life. We're, we're in this sermon series. Hey, God, where are you? Now, the odds are every one of us at some point in our life have cried out, God, where are you? Um, it, there are times that it seems like God is MIA, that God's ghosting us, right? And we're calling out and he's not answering. And, and life is going by at a million miles an hour and it's like, where is God? He's just, he's just absent without leave in my life. Never is that more acute than when we are going through a season of chaos. Now, now, chaos can be good. Chaos can be bad. There's good chaos, right? And bad chaos. Uh, but, but either way, when life gets really chaotic, it feels like we're being pulled in a hundred different directions. Good chaos is like when my two granddaughters come over to our house to stay with us. And uh, our, our two granddaughters have decided that mom and dad are not necessarily their play buddies, but uh, Lovey and Pop, that's Kim and me, we are. And, and so they, they love coming to our house uh, because they, they see every room of our house as this nice, clean, neat canvas on which to paint um, beautiful scenes of chaos, right? And their favorite thing to do right now is, okay, hey, we're going to build a fort in the living room. And you go, well, yeah, uh, quit being a baby, Gary. That's what granddaughters do. I know, I know, I know, and I'm sorry to be a baby. But, but you know, when they build a fort, it, like, involves every chair uh, available in our home, especially every chair around the dining room table. It involves multiple sheets. It involves every blanket that is not on a bed. I mean, they just started dividing partitions, and they're creating rooms. They We've got food service going on in there, and sometimes they invite Kim and me over for a visit, and, and by the time it is finished, I'm telling you, it is the biggest chaotic mess you've ever seen in your life. So some chaos is good, some chaos is bad, but here's the thing I've noticed. In times of chaos, the world gets really loud, and God gets really quiet. So we've all experienced the chaos, good and bad. Life is going a million miles an hour. It's pulling us in a hundred different directions, and we can't hear God. And, and when we cry out to him, it's like he is MIA. And so we all have experienced crying out to God and declaring, God, where are you in my chaos? Uh, the word chaos has been defined like this, a state of disorder and confusion, a disorderly mess, a jumble. And so this morning, if you've experienced that, and my guess is every one of us have, then, then I believe that God wants to speak to you about what he's up to in the midst of your chaos. 
Uh, we're going to use as, as kind of exhibit A, a man by the name of Jacob. He was one of the Old Testament patriarchs. And there's going to be a sense in which when I start talking about Jacob, you're going to kind of excuse Jacob and you're going to be going, oh man, he was one of the patriarchs. And so, so he never really experienced the kind of chaos that I'm experiencing in my life, Gary. I mean, after all, it's true. His granddad is none other than Father Abraham. Abraham, the father of all who come to God through faith rather than through works. And so his granddad is none other than honest Abe, okay? Uh, maybe I'm mixing up the metaphors there. But, but Abraham, right? And, and his dad is Isaac, and, and he himself was one of the patriarchs. His name was changed to Israel. He had 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel. And you're going, Gary, how can Jacob possibly relate to me and the chaos of my life? And yet, I'm going to make a case for the fact that Jacob went through a season of chaos that I doubt any of us in this room have ever or will ever experience. And as we study his example, I really believe that if you look at his example and you go, wow, I can see where God was in the midst of his chaos, then I want you to understand this. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you can bet your last penny that God is doing the same thing in your life. And so here's the thing. As we dive into the message this morning, there's one thing that I pray you will allow God to impress upon your heart, and it is this. In the chaos of your life, God is writing you into his story. Now, just hold that on the screen just for a moment, because here's the thing. As we talk about Jacob, I want you to just run this statement as a filter and just decide, okay, in the midst of Jacob's chaos, was God right there present and working and writing Jacob into his story? And if the answer is yes, then you can bet your last penny God is doing the same thing in the midst of your chaos. So let's dive in. You ready? Let's talk, first of all, about the chaos. Now, fair warning, we're going to dive right into the middle of Jacob's story. And, and Jacob's story, he's running for his life at the point where we're diving into the story. Have you ever watched a movie and the opening scenes is just of someone just running for their life and you don't even know what's going on? Maybe kind of like this scene from Indiana Jones. Here, watch this. Now, you've got to understand, as we pick up the story, that must be how Jacob feels in this moment. You talk about chaos, this boulder of chaos just rolling right at him. Uh, read with me from God's Word, Genesis 27, verse 41. Now, Esau, that is his older twin brother. Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, the days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. You talk about chaos. Now, if you want to start comparing chaos, good chaos, bad chaos, there's no chaos quite as chaotic or painful as domestic strife. And this qualifies as domestic strife, right? Threats have been made, and now there's no reconciliation in sight. Things have reached a boiling point. And Jacob, because his older twin brother is tougher and meaner, and he can follow through on this threat, Jacob is going to have to get out of Dodge, or in this case, Beersheba, and he's going to have to spend 20 years in chaotic exile. In Haran, with his mother, Rebecca's relatives, he is going to spend 20 years. Now, there's a whole lot of reasons why we could go into that. We're not going to for the purpose of this sermon. I mean, first of all, he's been accused of stealing his brother's birthright. He didn't steal his brother's birthright. He bought his brother's birthright. You go, oh, birthright. 
No, 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 you gotta understand something. In the first century, birthright was a big deal and being the oldest son was a big deal because you got a larger share of the inheritance. And Jacob wanted his older brother's share of the inheritance. And so his brother comes in hungry one day. He's made some soup. His brother says, I'm hungry, give me some soup. He goes, sell me your birthright and I will give you this soup. And so the Bible says Esau despised his birthright and he sold it literally for a bowl of lentil stew. Now, he didn't steal his brother's birthright, but he did steal his brother's blessing. You go, Gary, you're starting to lose me here. I don't really care about blessings. I know you don't, and I don't really that much, except in the, that day, listen, a father's blessing was everything. A father would bless his kids, and the greatest blessing was reserved for the oldest son. And Jacob wanted not just his father's birthright, he wanted his father's blessing. And so he does a whole lot of deceptive things, he puts on some goat skins, he makes his dad a meal, and he literally steals his brother's birthright, and now his brother Esau is hopping mad. It, this chaos is about to explode into a catastrophe. For the purpose of this message, we're not going to go into all the additional chaos in Jacob's life. I mean, he is spending 20 years in Haran. His father-in-law cheats him, changes his wages. Now, let's just stop and acknowledge, though, domestic chaos, when it involves in-laws, can become pretty chaotic and painful. Are we in agreement on that? Yes or no? There's some, there's some emphatic amens and some, I ain't saying nothing. Uh, but, but you know what I'm talking about, right? And, and so now think about this. His father-in-law is cheating him out of his wages. Uh, there, there's financial strife in the home. Uh, don't they say the number one cause of divorce is financial strife? People fighting over finances. And so we know there's a whole lot of strife going on. Add to that, his wife, Rachel, struggled with infertility. Add to that, on his way home, 20 years later, he hears, oh, hey, your brother Esau's coming out to meet you, and good news, he's bringing 400 men with him, and Jacob is going, shoot, we're dead, he's going to kill me, 20 years holding a grudge, get over it. 20 years of chaos, cut off from home and family, no texts, no phone calls, no trips home for Christmas. How many times in Haran, 20 years, did Jacob just cry out to God and go, God, where are you in the midst of this chaos? God, I just want to go home and enjoy a meal with my family where the knives are used for cutting the food and not each other. God, where are you? God, I just want to reconnect with my family. God, I just want to embrace my mom and my dad. God, why is it it's so unjust that my kids are growing up without ever once seeing their grandparents? God, where are you in the midst of this crazy chaos? The truth is, Jacob knew all about 20 years of chaos. Family strife is one of the most painful forms of chaos that there is. Some of you, right now this morning, if we were to interview you and you were to be really, really honest, put you on some truth serum, and you, you, you would say, man, my home life is anything but tranquil. If you can say that this morning, you know about the chaos. Some of you right now, you're living through at home this cycle of the calm before the storm, uh, trying to survive the storm, uh, trying to pick up the pieces after the storm, only to fall right back into the cycle of the calm before the storm, trying to survive the, you get the idea. And if that's you, you're going through that cycle, you know all about chaos, but family chaos comes in a lot of different forms, doesn't it? For some, uh, the, the chaos at home has to do with somebody in the family who has anger issues. And I mean, everybody in the family is tiptoeing around this individual because you don't want to light a fuse because it causes an explosion and leaves a lot of things broken. For others of you, uh, the family strife comes more in the form of an absentee parent, maybe absent 
uh, emotionally or maybe literally physically absent. They're just not around a lot. And, and, and you're maybe the child in the situation and you're going, what did I do? Why doesn't mom, why doesn't dad love me? And that's pretty chaotic in itself. Maybe for you the chaos is just single parent and there's no, hey, happy coexistence with the ex. Hey, we're raising this child together. No, no, no. For you and your situation, it's just an ongoing battle. Or maybe for you the chaos chaos at home is that you've done everything as a parent that you knew to do and you prayed and you raised your child in church and you brought them to the student ministry and yet now you see your child walking away and you're going God what's up with this I mean I did my part I raised up my child in the way they should go so that when they're older they wouldn't depart and here they're walking away what's up with this God and that's not even to talk about the chaos of infertility that some of you are facing and you've prayed to God and you've cried out to God and you've gone to doctors and you've done this for longer than you care to think. More years than you care to count and all you have to show for it are the emotional scars and the doctor's bills. See, the truth is, every one of us in this room have cried out at one time or another, hey God, where are you in the midst of my chaos? And let me tell you what adds insult to injury. In the midst of our chaos, there's always the pain of the gap. Jacob experienced it, I've experienced it, and you've experienced it. The gap between what we expected from God and what we experience in our life, we've all been there. Because the truth is, every one of us have certain ideas about who God is, and therefore we have expectations for what God is going to do in my life, what God is going to do in your life. We have these expectations. We have these promises from God that's just rolling around in our mind. When I was writing this sermon, I decided, okay, I'm just going to write down off the top of my head promises that, that just kind of are, are just on this Rolodex in my mind, just rolling around. No rhyme or reason to this. I just wrote them down just as fast as they came to me, and here's what God gave me. God God is good. God's never going to leave me nor forsake me. God's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Uh, God is a shield around me. God will protect me. God will supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. God does abundantly above all that I could ever ask or think. And, and, and the truth is, you've got your own list of promises that you believe God has promised you. And this is what God's going to do for you. And if you're going, oh, wait a minute, Gary. No, I'm, I don't have anything rolling around in my Rolodex. Then get your phone out, take a picture. These are pretty good promises. And this is not an exhaustive list. And so we have this idea, man, here's God, here's these promises, here's what I can expect from God. And then there's this huge gap between what I expect from God and what I experience in life. And let me tell you something, Jacob experienced the pain of the gap. Oh, he received, you remember he stole it, the blessing of his father. Listen to this. Now you can understand, Jacob would have assumed that his dad Isaac prayed and that these promises are not just from dear old dad. These promises are from his heavenly dad. These promises are from God. Here's the blessing that his dad prays over him. How would you like to have this set of promises? May God give you the dew of heaven and of the fatness of the earth and plenty of grain and wine. Good news, son. Your whole life, God's gonna bless you and provide for you and you're gonna have all the grain you can eat and all the wine you can drink. Let people serve you and nations bow down to you. Be Lord over your brothers and may your mother's sons bow down to you. It's even better, son. Here's the thing. God is gonna give you power and influence. And I'm telling you, listen, your whole life, Jacob, people are gonna bow down before you. People are gonna serve you. God is gonna give you great influence and you're gonna live a, such a significant, important, meaningful life. Cursed be everyone who curses you and blessed be everyone who blesses you. It gets even better, Jacob. God's got your back. God's gonna protect you. He's gonna curse everybody who curses you. Now, how... How would you like to have that set of promises? How would you like to have that expectation from God? Sure, God, I'll take that life. Sign me up. You're gonna give me all the food and drink I can handle. You got my back. You're gonna curse those who curse me. And God, you're gonna, you're gonna give me a life of influence and power and meaning and significance. 
How many times in 20 years up in Iran and did Jacob cry out, ooh, dad must have gotten a hold of some bad mushrooms that day. He thinks he heard from God, but he didn't hear from God, he heard from the devil. Because 20 years, my father-in-law cheating me, uh, influence, maybe he's talking about influence in the sheep out in the field, but I'm freezing at night and I'm, I, I'm, I'm hot during the day and, and I'm telling you, my life is no influence. Nobody's protecting me from my father-in-law cheating me. I'm telling you, boy, did dear old dad miss that. But it wasn't just his dad who blessed him. It was his heavenly father. On the way to Haran, Here's what God promises Jacob. Behold, I'm with you and will keep you wherever you go and will bring you back to this land for I will not leave you until I've done what I promised you. I'll take that life. It's like God saying, don't worry. Be happy. Don't worry about your father-in-law cheating you. No, no big deal. Don't worry about your wife struggling with infertility. No big deal. I got you. I got this. Uh, don't worry about being a person of influence. Those sheep, they love you. I mean, in the words of that poet, Bob Marley, it's like God was saying, hey, don't worry. Every little thing going to be all right. <laughs> and Jacob is like, Seriously, God, every time the music fades and Bob Marley stops singing, I'm staring into this ginormous gap between what I expected since you gave me the promise and what I'm experiencing in my life. See, there's three groups of people in here this morning, at least, who know all about the pain of the gap. We live life in these chaotic times and we experience the pain of the gap. And some who experience the pain of the gap are those who are far from God. In other words, you've never even made Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of your life. You've never confessed Jesus, you're my Lord, my God, my King. You've never placed your trust in him. But still, even though you're not a believer in Jesus this morning, you're not a child of God through faith in Jesus, you still have expectations of God. I mean, you've heard God is good and now all of a sudden you're thinking, Thinking, well, if God is good, he wouldn't let these bad things be happening to me. And that's one of the primary hindrances to you coming to faith in Jesus because of the pain of the gap. Well, I thought God's good. Obviously, he's not because he's letting this pain come into my life. You know who else can understand the pain of the gap? It's people who are not here, absentee Christians, uh, those who came to faith in Jesus and in coming to faith in Jesus, and they had these expectations. I'm gonna follow Jesus, and here's what Jesus is gonna do for me, and yet then their expectation uh, ran smack dab into the middle of their experience in this life, the pain of the gap. And maybe the pain of the gap came in the form of a divorce. Maybe it came in the form of getting laid off or falling out with a friend or church dysfunction and church hurt in your past. And those who are absentee Christians this morning, those who are not even here, they're not here because they had expectations from God and their experience was so painful, they've just slipped off into the shadows and said, I'll still believe in God, but I'm not gonna make any effort to follow him because following him doesn't help. But then there's another group who understand the pain of the gap, and that's the rest of us who are Christ followers. And we come to Jesus, and, and we know all about the gap. I mean, we, we'd love to have what God promised to Jacob through his dad. Sure, God, sign me up for a life where you give me all the provision I need, where you give me the protection, where every little thing gonna be all right. And, and God, yeah, where you make me a person of influence and and and. and Boy, I live a me. I'll take that. But most of us this morning would say, God, honestly, just to be honest with you, I would just settle for you helping me to pay my bills and get along with my family and just make life a little less painful. But we all know about the pain of the gap, don't we? And there's always a gap. Because in our fallenness and our humanness, we're never going to have enough in this life, are we? 
And in our fallenness and our humanness, we're never going to have enough provision. We're never gonna have enough power and influence. And God, I want more likes and more clicks and more influence. And we're never gonna have enough protection because it seems like pain always weasels its way into our life. It may be the death of a loved one. That's the pain. It may be disease. It may be the divorce of a parent. It may be strife at home or challenges at work. But we all experience the pain of the gap. And if we're not careful, the pain of the gap can lessen our love for the Lord and make us cynical about life and faith, make us question whether God is truly good and make us decide that we're gonna tolerate God and not really pursue God. But here's the thing. I want you to see the rest of the story. Because God, in the midst of Jacob's gap, even though Jacob couldn't see it at first, God was present in the midst of his gap. And number one, God was providing. Yeah, he spends 20 years in exile in Haran, but in 20 years, he has 11 sons, and there's one on the way who's gonna be born in Canaan. And by the way, uh, 20 years, uh, God provided sons and wives and possessions and flocks and servants. And you talk about protection. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. When he's on his way home, Esau shows up to meet him with 400 men. Jacob assumes, okay, my goose is cooked. I'm dead. 20-year grudge. Get over it, bro. And yet, here's what really happened. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him and they wept. You talk about protection. When your enemies start kissing you instead of trying to kill you, you know that is divine protection, amen? And God was protecting him. And God was positioning him. Think about this. This is Jacob. God changes his name to Israel. He's in the lineage of Jesus. He has 12 sons and to become the 12 tribes of Israel. 4,000 years later, we're still talking about Jacob who became Israel. I'm telling you, God positioned his life to be a person of influence and to live a life of meaning. Even though he spent 20 years in chaos living in the pain of the gap. Where's God in your chaos? God is providing for you and protecting you so God can position you to play a pivotal role in his story. Do you believe that this morning? Let me put it another way. In the chaos of your life, God is writing you into his story. So let me ask one more time. Anyone this morning going through chaos, Let me tell you something. The way you respond to the chaos in your life and the pain of the gap, the way you respond will determine whether or not you end up basically walking away from God and becoming bitter towards God and cynical towards the world. Or on the other hand, depending on how you respond to the chaos in your life and the pain of the gap, You respond another way, and it will lead to God making your story into a masterpiece, a bestseller, a must-read for all of eternity. You go, Gary, that's kind of a big promise. So what makes the difference? It's all in a name. See, the name Jacob means one who grasps the heel. Uh, The word The name Jacob means literally holder of the heel, supplanter. When he's born, Esau comes out first, but Jacob has a hold on Esau's heel, and he's always grasping, and he's always holding on. And there was an occasion, an occasion, uh, an encounter that Jacob has with God on his way back from Haran. And here's what it says. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. Oh, Jacob is wrestling with God. But Jacob said, I'll not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. God changed. Changes Jacob's name from Jacob to Israel, and Israel means he strives with God. 
See, in the midst of your chaos and the pain of your gap, you're either gonna go, God, you're MIA, so I'm gonna become MIA towards you. Or in the midst of your chaos and the pain of your gap, you're gonna say, God, I'm gonna do just what Jacob did. Just like he held on to Esau's heel and just like when you wrestled with him, God, he refused to let go. God, that's gonna be me. I am going to refuse to let go. I am gonna be one who strives with you. I am gonna be one who clings to you. God, I'm gonna keep praying. I'm gonna keep listening. I'm gonna keep confessing. I'm gonna keep surrendering my will to your will. God, I am going to be one who strives with you. What am I inviting you to do this morning? I'm inviting inviting you, first of all, to embrace the one who is standing in the gap for you. If you have never given your life to Jesus, listen, the way that you do that is you confess, Jesus, you are Lord of my life. I make you the Lord of my life. You repent of your sin. You place your faith in Jesus and you believe in him. And listen to me this morning. I invite you, if you've never done that, in in spite of the chaos, in spite of the pain of the gap, I invite you to take hold of the one who is standing in the gap for you, and his name is Jesus. And this morning, during the invitation time, during the response time, I invite you to just get up and go to that next step room, and there will be people there who will talk to you and share with you how you can embrace Jesus. First thing I invite you to do, if you've never done so, is embrace the one who's standing in the gap for you. Second, What am I inviting you to do? Strive with God in your gap. I'm inviting you this very day to declare what Jacob declared to God. God, I will not let go unless you bless me. See, the truth is, some of you are going through life and all you can see is the back of the tapestry. Have you ever seen a tapestry, the back of it? I mean, it's just a jumbled mess, right? It's just, you can't see. You can't understand. There's no rhyme, no reason. It's just chaos. And that's what Jacob saw for 20 years in Haran. God, here's this gap. Here's the pain of the gap. Here's the chaos. God, I don't understand what you're doing. God, you gave me such incredible promises, and now you're not following through on the promises. God, what is going on? And some of you, that's all you've seen for maybe more years than you care to count. But there comes a day when God flips the tapestry over and you get to see the other side. And the other side is this masterpiece, this thing of beauty. You get to see what God has been up to. And in Jacob's case, it was changing his name to Israel, giving him 12 sons, 12 tribes of Israel, uh, putting him in the lineage of Jesus. And we're still talking about it 4,000 years later. And we're going to go up to Jacob in heaven and we're going to say, way to go, Jacob. After 20 years, your response to the pain of the gap was, I'm not going to let go till you bless me. That's what I'm inviting you to do today. I'm inviting you right now to just tell God if he's not flipped the canvas over, if he's not shown you the beautiful, majestic masterpiece that he's making of your life, I invite you to tell God, I'm not gonna give up. I'm not gonna give in. I'm not gonna give out. I am gonna hold on to you, God, until you bless me. I'm not gonna let go unless you bless me. As a matter of fact, I just wanna ask you right now, would you just bow your heads with me? And right now, I'm gonna invite you to respond by striving with God, by reaching out and taking hold of God. Maybe you're going through a season of unimaginable pain and you are bitter and angry towards God and towards the one who has sinned against you or maybe right now the chaos is that you're so disappointed with yourself because you expected more of yourself you thought you'd be a better parent a better spouse a better child a better student a better athlete a better you name it and you've fallen so short so far short of what you believe God desires from you and what you desire for yourself listen in the gap I'm asking you right now to just say God I'm not gonna let go of you. God, I'm I'm not gonna let go of you. 
I'm not going to let go of you until you make my life into a masterpiece. Where's God in your chaos? I'm going to tell you, he's right there with you. Don't let go. Because one glorious day, God is going to flip the canvas and he is going to show you the masterpiece side. He's going to show you what he's been up to in the chaos of your life. God is writing you into his story. So right now, in these moments, I'm going to give you like a whole minute to just say to God, God, I'm going to cling to you even if. What's your even if? Even if my parents end up divorced, even if you don't get me the promotion. God, I'm gonna cling to you even if my child walks away. God, I'm gonna cling to you even if my parents don't come to faith. God, I'm gonna cling to you even if what the doctor says tomorrow is not good. God, I'm gonna cling to you. God, change my name to Israel. Change my name to one who strives with God because God, I'm not going to let go though you slay me, yet will I trust in you. Right now, would you just declare to God, God, I'm gonna cling to you. Just take just a few seconds, just a few moments, and then Richard will close us out.